Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about a uh, little hobby project I've been working on, which is a multiplayer roguelike for the Commodore 64. So uh, just to get a feel for uh, who I'm talking to, who had a Commodore 64 when they were younger? Okay, a handful. So who knows what it is? Okay, yeah, who here is younger than the Commodore 64? So a couple. Uh, 1982. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of uh, introduction. Like I said, I've met uh, most of you already. I'm also Canadian from Toronto. What is happening? Here we go. And uh, I've been a Commodore 64 enthusiast since 1986. And why is this going crazy? And uh, I've been dabbling with uh, technology and gaming and music uh, my entire life. And I have a day job in aerospace. All right, so why the Commodore 64? So this will, the next couple of slides are going to be a little bit of a nostalgia trip. So it is the best-selling computer of all time, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. 17 million units sold, but it's uh, just about to be overtaken by the Raspberry Pi. It was released in 1982, had a whopping 64 kilobytes of RAM, uh, one megahertz CPU, and 16 glorious colors. But the real strength of the 64 was gaming, so there were over 25,000 games available for the platform. It's, uh, and it's just a fun computer to work on because you're working at the bare metal. You don't have layers and layers of uh, libraries and so on. Uh, you can, but you can also get right down to the zeros and ones. You're coding in machine language, which is its own uh, challenge. And it's very well documented after you know, 30 plus years of reverse engineering and tinkering and poking and so on. Plus, there's a very active community in 2018 so people are, are gaming, collecting, developing, hardware hacking, modding, you name it. Just a fun platform to mess around on. And I wandered out of the light again. Okay, so my story. So back in 1986, this happened. I won a Commodore 64 in a raffle when a computer store opened up in my hometown. So that's the store manager. I've long forgotten his name, but he obviously was cool. He had the sunglasses indoors and the whole bit. <laughs> So that's, so that's how I got started. So when I brought it home, and uh, my parents were the, had encouraged me to enter this raffle, and when I won it, they said, all right, so we're going to institute a house rule. Half the time playing games, half the time learning how to program it. And that paid off. So we fast forward uh, 30 years, and I got my dream job working for, the, uh, collaborating with the Canadian Space Agency. So this is me and the team. Uh, we just loaded our code, oh, thank you. So this is our team with the company I work for, and why is this still moving around? And I'm out of the light again. Uh, and we just loaded our code onto the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which launched to uh, investigate an asteroid, and that's going to start in about three weeks. Ooh. All right, roguelikes on the Commodore 64. So again, the Commodore 64 was well known for its impressive game catalog. There's a website, gamebase64.com, and it lists 25,700 known games. Of those, uh, more than 200 are roguelikes or a variation, uh, Adventure 2D, RPG 2D, and there were just so many of them that I played and played for hours, and it's uh, become my favorite, uh, one of my favorite genres. All right, so uh, it is multiplayer, so how do you hook the Commodore 64 up to a network? So in 2002, a miracle occurred. A gentleman named Adam Dunkels in Sweden unveiled something called the Final Ethernet, a prototype 10 by 10 base T Ethernet cartridge. You plug it into the game port, and it has a Ethernet port on the back, and that puts your Commodore onto the network as a first-class network device. You aren't bridging it through a Linux machine or so on. It's there with its own TCP/IP stack and everything. Uh, Dunkel's released an uh, operating system called Contiki that included the IP stack and a whole bunch of demo apps, all open source, so everyone could pick it apart and learn from it. And since then, uh, numerous commercial and homebrew versions have appeared, so you can go and just buy a network card for your Commodore 64, plug it in, and you're off to go, ready to go. But people were developing tools, so they developed file transfer, and terminals, and chat programs, and cross-development tools, and web browsers. That's, that's great, but where are the games? Like, that's what the 64 is known for, is games. So I took it upon myself to, uh, you know, learn about uh, how to uh, code for network apps on the 64, and put together a couple little prototypes over the years. 
So I did one called Artillery Duel back in 2007. Very simple, just shoot 'em up game, going back and forth over a mountain, uh, just two players, peer to peer. Then I did a, a racing game called Net Racer. This introduced the notion of a server, and you could have up to eight players. And now you're into a, a shared game world. Uh, did a space shoot 'em up that's uh, kind of half finished in 2014. And uh, so this is a little more dynamic, a little more involved. And my latest challenge is this game. Uh, by the way, a source code for all of these is available on GitHub, so I encourage uh, folks who want to get into the retro network uh, game development space to take a look at those. And uh, any discussion of 64 multiplayer games is not complete without talking about Space Command, which it was written by uh, Dan Raguman and uh, Jeffrey uh, Arcaxo Brace. And this one is meaningful because it's it's an amazing game. It's eight 64s networked together and a 64 server playing this massive, insane version of Missile Command. It's really, really great. And unfortunately, Dan passed away earlier in the summer, so uh, a bunch of us are going to take up the mantle and finish the game off. All right, so this is my challenge uh, for myself, a roguelike. But what if the other characters in the dungeon you were running across were other players? So you could interact with them. You could go on quests together with them. You can team up with them against monsters. Work together to solve puzzles. Leave each other tools, clues, and share equipment. I think that would be pretty cool. So I have to have the obligatory slide, is this really a roguelike? It is real time because of the network and multiplayer aspect. It's not turn-based. It's one single shared instance, so there is a server running that anyone can connect to, and it, it uh, persists and you're all in the same shared instance. It's multiplayer. The objects persist, so if you pick up an item and drop it, and if you come back three weeks later, it'll still be there, assuming no one else has picked it up. And monster persistence, so the monsters you know, are always there in the server and they're running around even when no players are, con are connected. So some people have fish tanks, I have virtual entities running around in a server. So this is, you know, it could be more akin to a multi-user dungeon, but uh, we'll accept it. In a lot of cases, I uh, kept the you know, usual tropes from uh, roguelikes, but I've introduced a couple of elements that I think are fairly unique. And you have, can carry items in either your left hand or your right hand. There's an explicit attack command, because I eventually want to introduce ranged weapons. So uh, the bump to attack wouldn't work. So with, with uh, the two-hand model, you can double up. You can have two swords and uh, re be a real badass, or two shields and be more on the defensive, or one of each, or what have you. And you've got it other items in the, uh, in the dungeon you can pick up, uh, potions, keys, gold, etc. There's no inventory. So to encourage multiplayer, you, know, you can only hold items in your left hand or your right hand. So if you want to carry a sword and a shield and a key and a potion, you have to you know, bring a friend. There's a, uh, the other thing with the multiplayer is uh, there's some magic items. For example, a key, you wouldn't want someone to pick up a key to a door, open the door, run through it, close it behind them, and then lock out all future players. So the mechanic there is when you use the key, it teleports back to its origin. You can use or inspect items, which gives you slightly different uh, results. And on the C64, you can play with a joystick or a keyboard. And uh, being multiplayer, you, know, you want a way to uh, chat with other players, so I've set up a Discord voice chat server just to recreate that feeling of sitting in a basement and playing games head to head with your friends, even if you're uh, opposite parts of the world. And there's a bit more to the game that uh, I'll leave folks to discover. And there are multiple clients available. So I've done, I started off with the Commodore 64, but oddly enough, not a lot of people have Commodore 64s with network cards. So I ported it to JavaScript, so you can uh, just play it in your browser. But I kept the character set and so on. Uh, I've also, there's also a Telnet client, so if you want the true ASCII experience, you can Telnet to the server and see it in glorious ASCII. But you're still in the same shared game instance with everyone else. And I've done a bit of work with uh, having it displayed properly on VT100 terminals. But I want to expand this. Like, my vision is that anyone with a retro computer, VIC-20, Tandy Coco, Atari, Apple II,
could connect to this and all play head to head on their uh, platform of choice. So a little bit of how this is done under the hood. The server is written in Java 8. Uh, the C64 client, I uh, use a 6502 cross-assembler called CA65. The network stack uh, is an open source library that I could just download called IP65. And uh, the networking protocol for the networking geeks is just UDP with uh, simple acts. And so you just, uh, every time there is a change on the screen, you know, we stream, we, uh, I send that, or I send a one hertz update, so once a second, just to keep the screen up to date. Internally, the server, it, this is very loosely a, a model view controller architecture. I've been hearing a lot today about ECS, and I think I'm halfway there, so I'm going to uh, you know, tweak things uh, that way. But uh, here's how this goes. So there's a model. This is your data structure with all the maps, your objects, and entity locations, and logic for what you can do. You have your controller. So this is all entity actions go through the controller. So that applies to both players and monsters. There's a view, you know, like a camera, that uh, gives you your representation of your immediate view. And there's a thin layer on top of the view where it does the translations to the different encodings, Petsky or ASCII or uh, UTF-8, et cetera. Then there's a uh, socket interface that handles the networking to the different uh, clients going through the translation layer. And there's also a feedback loop for the monsters. So they interact with the world the same way as the players. Uh, the monster behavior is a very simple uh, finite state machine. They have different states that they can be in and uh, different triggers for alternating between the states. And so by tweaking these uh, state transitions, you can give the monsters slightly different uh, personalities. So the game levels. So I have a mini uh, test server running with uh, four levels, 100 by 100 tiles. It's a mix of hand edited and procedurally generated. So it procedurally generated you know, the levels and then did a couple of manual tweaks. But I have a vision of this being a very large game with 10 levels, 1,000 by 1,000 tiles, and you can wander around and hope, you know, uh, find other players, find other uh, parties, and uh, unlock everything. So I do have a demo server running, and this is the point where you all jump on it and the server crashes. <laughs> so there's the website to access the uh, uh, JavaScript client, so rogue.jamicsignal.com slash rogue. There is a Telnet interface, again, rogue.jamicsignal.com and port 3006. And if you go to that website, uh, for those of you who do want to try it on a real 64 or a, uh, an emulator, there is a, a PRG file, which is the virtual disk image, uh, to try it. And so here's a challenge to you all. The game is winnable. There is a, uh, a task that you can do that will, quote unquote, uh, complete the game. Uh, you stay in the game and keep on uh, running around doing your thing. But if someone could tell me the magic word, you will be the first one to complete the game. To-do list. There's lots to do here. Uh, the game doesn't have a name. <laughs> this is actually turning out to be the hardest part, is coming up with a good name for it. I want to introduce different character types, like right now you're just the player. Uh, I wanted to add ranged weapons, like I said before. Improve the uh, monster movement with the A star search and so on. There's no uh, vision algorithms or ray tracing. Right now you just see everything. And so lots of little details to work out, but it's a hobby project. I'm tweaking and exploring, and uh, we'll see how that uh, goes. So if anyone wants to collaborate, I'm looking for assistance in all these areas, pixel artists, designers, play testers, especially play testers, clients for other systems, uh, feedback on the gameplay, how to balance the combat system. I want to introduce little puzzles into the game that would require multiple players to go in. You know, player one does this at the same time while player two does this, and it opens up a, a portal or what have you. Yeah, you know, improvement to the monster behaviors, you know, count coders, and I, what I've got there is login system. This is somewhat inspired by uh, Minecraft, the idea that you would have a profile. You would log into the server, do your thing, and then uh, log out, and then return at a later time to complete your quest. Oh yeah, and the, the game still needs a name. 
So all the code for this game is uh, it's open source under the MIT license on GitHub, and there is the address to find it. Let's see everyone's querying to write it down, and I went out of the light again. It's so a few uh, acknowledgments here. So uh, the 64 networking code was actually written by Per Olufsen and John O'Downs. That's the IP65 library. Uh, Playtesting was Andreas Bloomquist and Tiffany Antipolsky. The, the graphics, I made a couple of them, but the uh, bulk of them come from some guy who just identifies himself as Q0 Atlantis. Uh, my friend Robin gave me tons of advice and motivation. And uh, the roguelike dev community on Reddit, which is, I uh, went on there to find some algorithms and tips and found out about this weekend and thought, this is amazing. I have to come and uh, check this out and meet you all. And also uh, David Yaud, here's here somewhere, and the maid who uh, lent me a bunch of hardware so I didn't have to truck it all on the plane from Toronto. And a little plug for this event we are doing in December in Toronto called the World of Commodore. It's a big conference you know, like this, about this size, all devoted to Commodore and 8-bit and retro machines. So we'd love to see you all there. And uh, finally, this is how to reach me. I have a blog at jammingsignal.com. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and there's my email. And that's it. Thank you very much. Want to take some questions? Uh, sure. How much time do I have? I haven't. Uh, you got got lots of time. Really? Is it an hour to do that? I think so. I don't know. Yeah. Any questions? Questions. What are some names that you've rejected? Uh, is Jason Scott here? No, I think he is not. He, Jason Scott wanted to call it Bloom Quest after my last name, and I just immediately shot that down. Uh, I have a question. Hello. Yes. Uh, you have a explicit attack button or explicit use button for uh, attacking monsters. How was yeah. that accepted by players? Um, it, it took a little bit of walking through. Oh, I forgot to mention, I do have you know my 64 here and a little network set up over in the arcade area. So if you, have, if you haven't tried it, come by during a break and uh, give it a shot. Um, so it did need some explaining because it's a little different. Because it's a little subtle because you know if you have a potion, you use it. And if you have a sword, do you use it? Well, no, you do an attack. But if you're holding two swords, how do you say, I want to use this one and use that one? So the attack just stacks up all the, uh, the weapons you're carrying. So it, it took a bit of coaching, and uh, people did get the hang of it you know, fairly quickly. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that needs a little bit of a, The way the game is set up now is the first level is sort of a tutorial. So you have to do some very simple tasks to get used to that mechanic before you can get to the real game on the second level. Yeah, we'll start here. Can you uh, say a little bit about your time system? Like, how, wh when do monsters take turns? How often are players allowed to take turns? Okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, since it's real time, not turn-based, well, so the server is running on a uh, 50 millisecond tick. So every 50 millisecond there's a tick. All the players and monsters are updated. And so the, uh, that's sending new information to the players, seeing what the players are doing. But one of the uh, attributes or components, as I've learned the buzzword today, is you know, how fast you can move. So you're allowed to move one square every, say, 300 milliseconds or so on. And that's all managed with timers attached to the individual entity objects. I, uh, this might be a stupid question, but when you work on this, do you code on the actual Commodore 64, or do you code on some modern editor and then upload the code, the, like the compilation on? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I code on the PC, oh. and, uh, and uh, <laughs> there there are excellent uh, developer tools for the 64, but you know I'm I'm pretty hardcore, but not that hardcore. <laughs> well, who who knows Eclipse? Who's a software developer that knows Eclipse? Yeah, so there are Eclipse plugins for developing Commodore 64 code. Uh, I, I have a simple question. Might a simple UDP act be my magic wand? Sorry, will it? Might a simple UDP act be my magic wand? UDP act beat your magic wand? Be my magic wand. I'm not uh, sure I'm getting the question. Uh, 
you said that the network and multiplayer functionality was based on UDP yes. with a system of simple acts. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Um, Talk to me afterwards and let's uh, try and find the common language. <laughs> okay. Uh, Uh, so, um, if the monsters are constantly running around when there is no players around, are they going to pick stuff up? And like, like net hack, you run into the gnome with the wand of death, because <laughs> uh, that seems like it could be really deadly if nobody was in that level, and suddenly the monster has everything. <laughs> yeah, well, the monsters have, uh, the monsters as implemented now have no inventory at all. They can't pick anything up. But that would actually be a neat gameplay. But I would limit them in the same way that they could only carry one or two items. Because this opens up, you know, the monster opens up the possibility of NPCs. So you run into someone else in the dungeon, you're like, is this an actual player or is this an AI? Or does it matter? Any other questions? So I imagine logging back in and there's like something right next to me that's going to kill me. But I'm curious, like, do you have a like a spawn limit? Do things keep spawning when nobody's playing or just moving around when no one's playing? Oh, they, uh, well, it, de it depends on the monster. Some of them, the behaviors are they just sit and wait for something to come within their visual range and then they go after it. Other ones are just wandering around uh, yeah, aimlessly. Any other questions? Where do you go to find the Discord server? Oh, if you go to the uh, website that I gave earlier. Oh, you have to see that picture again. Sorry, one second. Oh, so if you go to that uh, website, there'll be a number of, there's a big button for entering the game, and then there's uh, uh, links to the Discord chat, uh, to the forums that I've set up for the game, and for downloading the 64 client. So it sounds like you're sort of in the late 90s in terms of Commodore 64 development, right? And so I wonder where, where the hot frontier is. In com like, are people working on like MMOs, like free-to-play, gotcha financed games for the Commodore 64 yeah, crowd? Well, or what, what do you think the frontier is? And in Commodore 64 dev. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of untapped potential in games. Like there are, you know, there are people working on giant, you know, on single player RPGs that go on and on and on. And it's uh, not enough, I think more people are going, I hope more people are going to tap into this multiplayer space. That's why I've made my code available so they can try it out. Um, but uh, there's still a, a lot of homebrew and a handful of commercial games coming out for the 64 still. Uh, a lot of platformers. Platformers are very, very popular. And we'll just, we'll see where it goes. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you all. <laughs>